TV on C-SPAN 2. Now, a House Rules Committee hearing on airline security legislation. The chairman and ranking member on the House Transportation Committee discussed the bill at Tuesday's hour and 45-minute hearing. The House is scheduled to take up the bill later today. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. Today we have an opportunity to take serious action to ensure that our civilian air system is safe and secure. Strong airline security legislation will assure the American people that the freedom of air travel will not be threatened. Congress and this committee are committed to passing legislation that meets the challenges of this new war on terror. I look forward to hearing the testimony of my colleagues who consider this matter very carefully. We're here to consider the Secure Transportation for America Act of 2001, H.R. 3150. And we are very pleased to welcome the distinguished chairman of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, as well as the ranking member, Mr. Oberstar. Before I call on our witnesses, I'd uh, simply like to state uh, to the committee, we, of course, were very saddened with the news that we got last Friday of the passing of uh, our dear friend and colleague and the former chairman of this committee, Mr. Solomon. And I think members are aware at this point that there will be a plane that uh, will leave uh, tomorrow morning to go to the uh, service, which will be held uh, in Glens Falls, New York. We're going to leave at 8.15 from the steps here uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, I know that uh, it's been uh, difficult on all of us with the news that we've uh, gotten. And Jerry Solomon did a superb job as the first Republican chairman of this committee in four decades. And uh, it's been a tough act for me to follow. But he was a great model and did an awful lot for all of us. So I. Just wanted the members to uh, to know that. We'll obviously tomorrow evening be doing a special order on the House floor uh, for Mr. Solomon. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Frost. Uh, first, as, as to Jerry Solomon, um, I found him to be a uh, very constructive person to work with. We often disagree, but I uh, found that uh, Jerry Solomon was fair to the Democrats on this committee. Uh, we joined our disagreements very strongly on the floor. And uh, I join you in mourning his passing, and uh, uh, I will be accompanying you, as I know other Democrats will be, uh, to his funeral. Thank you very much for um, that. As to, uh, as to this very important piece of legislation, uh, there is a difference of opinion about this legislation. Uh, many Democrats feel very strongly that the people who should do the screening at airports should be federal employees. Mr. Overstar will speak to that in just a moment. Um, I regret that, the, that this legislation has been delayed in going to the floor for several weeks now. Uh, it passed by a 100 to nothing margin in the Senate. Uh, the country is served by prompt action on this very important matter. It is unfortunate that we did not have this matter go to the floor sooner. And we're here so that we can move promptly on it, and we appreciate that. And we're happy now to hear from the distinguished chairman of the committee, Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, yeah, I'll say it again if you want me to say it, but I think he heard me. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for scheduling this hearing on H.R. 3150, the Secure Transportation for American Act of 2001. Everybody knows that September the 11th has caused us to take a hard look. Just respect my good friend from Minnesota has making, taken a hard look for a long time. And unfortunately, some of the recommendations he has made and we have made have not been followed through. And I do think we see that as a weakness. But. The terrorist acts of September have reduced the sense of security and safety that all Americans feel when they're American soil. We have taken our safety and our liberty too much for granted. H.R. 3150 is a result of a great deal of hard work by our aviation subcommittee as Chairman John Micah. I want to stress this, Mr. Chairman. John Micah held hearings and conducted extensive research to find out which system of security work would best be best for our aviation transportation needs. Not only aviation, but other forms of transportation that's covered under my bill. This bill establishes broad authority to deal with the threats on all transportation modes. 
by setting up a new transportation security administration within the department of transportation the new administration will be headed by the undersecretary whose sole job will protect our transportation systems from terrorist threats and terrorist actions h r thirty one fifty requires the undersecretary of transportation security aviation to resume to assume all responsibility for aviation security when three within three months of final passage of the bill unlike the senate bill and including the bill introduced by my colleague mr oberstar h r thirty one fifty does not mandate that airport security screeners be 100 percent federal employees however let's make it perfectly clear the deal bill does federalize the screening process however the issue is not federal versus non-federal employees conducting the screening of passengers in their bags the real issue is how to achieve the highest level of security for the traveling pu public particularly within the next few months while we are at war against the tourists who use our air transportation system to attack us locking into a system that prohibits the use of any private contract workers at all levels that all leaves the air transportation system vulnerable to disruption and reduce security there is no guarantee that federal employees will do a better job than private employees but that's not the real issue the real issue is giving the presence of present flexibility and the money to get the job done the real job is to take the job of screening passengers away from the airline and give that job to the federal undersecretary for security who will issue, ensure that the job gets done using both federal employees and private contracts to obtain the best trained and motivated workforce possible. H.R. 3150, the Secure Transportation of American Act, addresses all these security issues to achieve a workable system that provides real security as quickly as possible. I request your assistance in reporting on an appropriate rule that contributes to the passage of this important legislation. May I say, Mr. Chairman, uh, there's been criticism about the length of time. Uh, that's one thing I have never prided myself is, is knee-jerk reaction. Uh, the Senate, sure, they acted. They acted with an irresponsible bill. The bill doesn't do the job. In fact, in fact imposes some restrictions upon the airline industry that I think are uncalled for. In the case of Alaska, they have a provision there put in by Senator Cole to limit the uh, tonnage of uh, 12,000 pounds, and anybody carries 12,000 pounds, pounds has to, in fact, have the same security provisions as a major airliner. Now, I know Mr. Oblastar's district, he has some small carriers that are in the remote areas that would be adversely affected by the legislation the Senate passed. I can go on and on about the Senate bill, but the Senate bill is not well thought out, it does not do the job, and I believe our bill does the job. It should be done for great security for our aviation industry. Thank you very much, Mr. Oberstar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, also join uh, you and Mr. Frost in expressing my uh, great uh, uh, shock, uh, really, and, and uh, deep sorrow on the loss of uh, our former colleague, Jerry Solomon. Many a time I came before the committee uh, when he was either in the, as the ranking member or later as chairman, and treated uh, always with uh, great uh, respect and, uh, and dignity and great personal integrity. We all had uh, profound respect for uh, Mr. Solomon and his uh, advocacy in the House. Um, I also regret that uh, my uh, chairman and I are, are not on the, on the same page on aviation security. We worked together uh, uh, for quite some time to craft a bill that could be a, a committee product bipartisan bill in the uh, long-standing spirit of this committee. But uh, there came uh, along some uh, differences, differences that I think we could have bridged, but there were other forces at work in the House that kept us from getting there. And we come today uh, uh, with one substantial difference. I propose that the, and request that the Rules Committee make in order as the Democratic uh, substitute, or substitute that I would, not the Democratic substitute, substitute that I would offer on a bipartisan basis with uh, Mr. Gansky and others uh, to the base bill offered by Chairman Young. The uh, bill we would offer would be the uh, bill passed by the Senate S-14 47. I would further ask that uh, if this bipartisan amendment in the nature of a substitute passes, 
and H.R. 3150 so amended passes that the rule provide for immediate consideration of the Senate passed Aviation Security Bill S. 1447, which is being held at the Speaker's desk. And if S. 1447 passes, we then request that H.R. 3150 be laid on the table. Uh, the difference that we have uh, on, on uh, the central issue of how screening shall be conducted at America's airports. And as Chairman uh, Young graciously said, I've been at this for a long time. I chaired the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee in the late 80s and the Aviation Subcommittee in the 90s. And with uh, uh, Mr. Gingrich as uh, my partner in those years, we conducted extensive hearings on aviation security in uh, executive session. And with his uh, participation, crafted the uh, legislation requested by then-President Bush to establish the Presidential Commission on Aviation Security and Terrorism, known as the Pan Am 103 Commission, on which I served, along with John Paul Hammerschmidt in the House and uh, uh, Senators Lautenberg and D'Amato from the Senate. We took the uh, 63 recommendations of the Commission there were 64, one you couldn't enact into law, dealing with national will, and crafted those into what became the Aviation Security Act of 1990. It was said then, <coughs> in the aftermath of Pan Am 103, that aviation has changed forever, that aviation security has changed forever. But it was hardly a year after the bill was signed into law that the airlines were lobbying against one of its basic provisions that there be security background checks for airport screeners. It's taken 10 years to get that provision alone enacted into law and implemented, and that was only done September 17th, just passed. That's too long to wait. We have proposed in the uh, Senate passed bill is in some respects not the broader reach of legislation that I would have crafted or that Mr. Young and I would have crafted together. But a democratic alternative alone is not going to pass this House, being very candid about it. The bill the Senate passed, 100 to nothing, you can't get 100 to nothing vote in the Senate on apple pie. They did it on this. And I think we need to move quickly. We've waited seven weeks without bringing security to the House floor. We now have an opportunity to do it. The screener function under the terms of the Senate passed bill would establish screeners under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice with qualifications set by the Attorney General to perform the screener function at 137, 137 largest airports. At those below that level, that is the smaller commercial non-hub airports, which roughly means those with 300,000 emplanements a year, security could be provided by local law enforcement authorities contracted for by the Attorney General. There are many airports in America where uh, you have only four to six flights a day. People would say, why do you have a federal screener sitting here all day when our local law enforcement police, sheriff, could do this job? properly trained and compensated through the uh, Justice Department. That is what we would propose to do here. Well, thank you and very I'm much. Let me rest at that point. Thank you very much, Mr. Question. Oberster. We appreciate it. I see that we're joined by uh, Mr. Micah and Mr. Lipinski. If you'd like to come forward, gentlemen, if you have some uh, comments that you'd like to add. Uh, 
to the uh, remarks of the chairman and ranking minority member of the, the committee. Please, please proceed, and uh, we'll begin with questions then. Mr. Micah? Well, let me uh, say, members of the Rules Committee, that I think this legislation is, uh, is something that's beyond uh, politics as usual at the House because I think this is, this is so important to the future of the flying public and each and every one of us, our families, anyone who gets on a, a plane or has to feel secure. In, in our committee, we, we held five open hearings uh, we heard from literally dozens and dozens of witnesses. We brought in experts from around uh, the world and the country to try to put together the best uh, possible plan. Uh, if I can ask staff to pass out some of these. Um, I think it's important that, that the Rules Committee understand what we did. Can I get some of our staff? We've got the Rules Committee staff here to help you, John. Okay. These are the responsibilities that we evolved for a, a deputy, I'm sorry, an Undersecretary of Transportation. If you look at an organization chart right now for the Department of Transportation, no one is in charge of transportation security. We went through and we listed every conceivable responsibility and we had agreement from the Democrats uh, on that issue. If you look at the Senate bill, and I have a copy of the Senate bill here, I would venture to say that 90% of the Senate has never read this legislation. This would be a travesty to enact uh, for the American people. We have very clear lines of authority again and specific responsibility. This is the chart, and staff again, pass this chart out. I defy anyone to see how this, here, pass those around. Keep the bottom one. Keep the bottom one out if you could. I defy anyone to see how this bill, the Senate bill, will work. It creates the most fragmented, disjointed approach to aviation security that you could possibly imagine. It creates, as you heard uh, Mr. Overstar, several tiers of authority and responsibility. Uh, just look through this bill and try to figure out who is responsible for what elements. Air marshals are, are uh, divided into uh, several areas. Responsibility for screening, it's unclear at best. Law enforcement officials, you'll have some uh, state and local at some airports, as you just heard testimony. You'll have uh, others uh, uh, at, 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 at different size airports, hubs, non-hubs. Uh, it also refers to medium size and uh, small airports. Again, it's just a disjointed function. The worst part about the Senate bill, should we pass it, is it does not provide for the biggest hole in, in, in our problem with aviation security. And that's rulemaking. On September 11th, there was no, there was no rule in place for uh, setting standards, high standards for baggage screeners. Absolutely no rule. It's been six years trying to get a rule in place. The Senate bill has no provision for rulemaking for that. We've tried to get uh, the latest type of equipment at airports. This is equipment that's available. This equipment will detect bombs. It will uh, detect uh, plastic weapons, such as the ones that we believe got on the air, uh, aircraft on September 11th. Uh, there's, we've been trying to get a rule passed, and it's been beaten and beaten, uh, that you cannot get this technology. The Senate bill doesn't even address this uh, type of uh, of technology uh, rulemaking ability. So there's no rulemaking, the biggest flaw in the bill. It would be a disaster to enact the Senate legislation. I'll be glad to go into more detail. Those are some of the major discrepancies we have, and we have a comparison of all of the discrepancies uh, uh, for each of the members.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have a situation here that this aviation security legislation really should have been passed when we passed the bailout of the airlines. That's the time to do it. I said at the time that you can give these airlines billions of dollars, but unless the American public is sure that they're going to be safe and secure in the air, you're not going to get people back flying. And it, that's exactly what's happened. Now we're six, seven weeks away from that bailout bill. Uh, before we're going to get the security legislation passed. I support Mr. Oberstar's position. We really have three bills here. We have the Senate passed bill, 100 to nothing. We have the Republican bill here in the House, uh, Mr. Young's bill. And we have a bill that the Democrats on the Infrastructure and Transportation Committee has introduced. This issue should go far, far beyond politics. This issue should be an issue that is decided for the benefit of the American flying public. And really the way to do that, because there's been tremendous, tremendous coverage of this issue, is to give the American people an opportunity to have their representatives quite frankly choose in a free, open, fair, unencumbered way if they want to have the screeners at airports be federalized or contracted out in the manner they have been since commercial aviation took this over. That's the way, if you're going to craft a political rule, the American public is going to be left out of the process only by crafting a rule where they are given an opportunity to have their representatives vote in an open way on federalizing is the way the American people are really going to be served here. I want to say that I worked with uh, Congressman Micah, Congressman Young, Congressman Oberstar. We have all tried to come together on a bill that would be beneficial to the American flying public. 90% of their bill is 90% of our bill. But we do have a few differences, but we mainly have the difference on federalizing. I'm willing to allow the House of Representatives representing the American people to make the decision on this, but we should be given a free and clear opportunity to make that decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. We uh, appreciate the, uh, the hard work that all of you have uh, put into this effort, and I, I do know that we would uh, like to have had this bill uh, in place even before September 11th, frankly, but we have a responsibility here to um, to pursue in a deliberative manner a very important issue. And with the complexities that were pointed out by Mr. Micah, I think it's clear that that uh, we need to do this correctly. Uh, and so I uh, I congratulate all of you. We we do know exactly what the difference is, and uh, clearly. We uh, hope that this committee will provide an opportunity for a free-flowing debate on uh, the differences that do exist and that were held uh, in your committee as well. So I don't have any questions. I think it's very clear. Mr. Young, if you uh, I comment. just, you know, I'm disappointed my good friend, my good colleague, Mr. Oberstar, supporting the Senate amendment. Uh, I think the Senate bill, as I've said, public is a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, the Democrat bill, is, we, we worked very close. We got up to the last 10 percent. We have a difference of opinion. But the Senate bill, as Mr. Mike has said, splits the security responsibility between two different agencies. Uh, it gives, you know, the justice responsibility over screening, which, by the way, the uh, Attorney General does not want this and has written letters to that effect and made statements to that effect. He does not want this responsibility. And as I told the airlines, if you want the Justice Department being in the same bed, it also studies the mergers. Uh, labor disputes, etc. You're, you're badly mistaken. There's just so many things wrong with the Senate bill, and I say it disappoints me that my good friend is supporting the Senate bill. Um, he says he can't get the Democrat bill to the floor. Uh, I can argue at the Democrat bill, and, and, and see, I think I can win that. For or against it, I can bring the facts to the floor. But to have the Senate bill be considered is, is a disappointment to me, and it's mischievous. And that's the thing that bothers me the most. Thank you. I think you've uh, made that clear. Ms. Price. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for your hard work. This is very important work for our country. 
and and I know that it has been a long, tedious process, and this committee appreciates your work. Um, I would like to ask uh, the chairman, what is the president's position on this bill, and uh, are they in support of it? The president is heavily in support of it. Uh, he has publicly stated that, his written letters to the effect. We had a meeting today down at the White House uh, on this issue, and he strongly supports it because he truly believes it's the best way to have the best security. Uh, again, I, I want to stress the fact just to pass a bill doesn't solve a problem. Uh, the Senate bill does not give us any security. It's just a, a headline grab, uh, grabbing point, by the way. It was 100 to nothing because of the voice vote. There were three people on the floor. Uh, so I can't say it was 100 to nothing because there was nobody there, which is not unusual. But the fact of the matter, he strongly supports this. Secretary Mineta supports it. Ashcroft opposes the Senate bill, supports my bill. Is it fair to say that this bill gives the, the president more flexibility than the a Senate bill? Absolutely. And remember, jo John Mike is the subcommittee chairman, and, and, and Mr. Oberstar included. They had hearings with all other countries in their form of uh, terrorist restriction and security. And it was decided, remember, they used to be nationalized, and that's really what the, the Senate does nationalize it. They have gone away from that, so they give the ability to take in contract with proper private security people that have the expertise to do it. Well, it would seem to me that the, the state of the art of, of security um, mechanisms and machinery and um, the way things change so fast in that industry that we would, want, would not want to put anything into law that might change in a year's time and allow the White House and, and the Secretary uh, the freedom to make the rules that they deem appropriate. Give and you an idea. One of the problem, one of the problems we have right now is because we do believe the FAA is so far behind. It's a federal agency, and I believe if we do the same thing that the, the Senate bill wants to do. You're going to have the same gridlock after no response, no ability to address the issues of security. Now, Mr. Oberstar and I can disagree, Mr. Frost and I disagree, but keep in mind, my goal, and he says his goal, is the best security. I argue the Senate bill does nothing. It's absolutely a chaotic piece of legislation, typical of the Senate side. Send it over here, and they'll take it or leave it and have people on TV every, every Sunday talking about how great the bill is. And, and this bill is broader than the Senate bill, I understand from my conversation with Mr. Micah <coughs> last week. Our bill week. does much more. It makes a better secure system. Um, just one other very technical thing. Um, I had a particular interest in protecting people that were holding tickets if an airline might go out of business. Now, we certainly hope that that doesn't happen. We've done our very best to assure that. And I appreciate the, the committee putting in the sense of Congress language. I would like it to have been stronger, but um, I think that that will take us in the right direction. I just want to express my gratitude. We couldn't go any further, Ms. Price, because of jurisdictional problems. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, if I could just respond, I want to make it perfectly clear and put it on the record here that the president has said, you know, that he will sign, you know, whatever bill, you know, is passed over here. He has not, not only has he not said, you know, that he would veto anything, he said whatever bill comes out of the House and Senate, he will sign. Now, he may have a degree of preference in a bill, but he's more than happy to sign any he's bill that comes out of it. He's not happy to sign any bill. Well, the well Andy of Card seemed to think that he would be happy to sign the bill, no, Mr. Chairman. The I statement of administration said. policy that I saw, he clearly favors the House version. Right. Is that correct? All right, thank you. Thank well, you, Mr. Chairman. We were just with him an hour ago, and he said he would... Okay, he can stand... Uh, fine. I just want to put on the record once again, though, Andy Card, his chief of staff, said he'd sign whatever bill came out of here. So there's no veto threat. Mr. Frost. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Young, and I have a couple of other questions. Uh, Mr. Young, uh, we have federal law enforcement personnel guarding our borders, protecting the Capitol, protecting the White House, and we don't contract out with private companies to hire security guards to do any of that. Uh, why do you think airport security should be contracted out to private companies, and especially our... after those private companies failed to ensure air safety on September 11th? Because there we're under the airline, airport, jurisdiction. Under our bill, we federalized the process of letting the contracts go with certain standards. And secondly, Mr. Frost, as you well know, uh, who, who protects our nuclear plants? That wasn't my question. Well, I understand the question. My, my question, question was plants, who protects us here in the Capitol, who protects the White House? Well, okay, we I, don't contract I, that The out. nuclear plants, the most dangerous area in the United States, are contracted out under strict guidelines, and that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't say they can't be federalized. 
This says it isn't mandatory. If, if Everything be federalized. If contracting out is so wonderful, why don't we contract out our own security here in the Capitol, Mr. Young? Maybe we should. Well, y'all are in you charge. Maybe you should. Y'all are you in feel charge, secure Mr. Right Young, now? and y'all you have, feel chosen, secure y right have now? chosen not to. Do you feel secure? Mr. Overstar, I would ask you the, basically the same question I asked Mr. Young. Why should we contract this out when we don't contract out security at the White House or at the Capitol or on our borders? Um, and likewise, we don't, we don't contract out the Immigration and Naturalization Service or the Customs Service or the uh, U.S. Marine Corps. We don't, we don't uh, uh, contract out any of our military activities. And this issue is a national security issue. There are airline functions, fueling the aircraft, bringing food on board, checking the baggage, loading the baggage on board the aircraft. Those are airline functions. There are airport functions running the airport, doing the parking, oh, that's their responsibility. <coughs> Security is a national responsibility. The attack on September 11 was an attack on the flag of the United States, not, a, not an attack on United and American Airlines. The attack on Pan Am 103 in 1988 was an attack on the flag of the United States. We need a national security response. And Security uh, contracted out with all that oversight that uh, uh, that uh, uh, my colleague, the chairman of the subcommittee, uh, referred to is so good. Then why was there a, co a colossal failure at Heathrow Airport, where they have exactly this system, where the uh, British Airport Authority contracts out with private security company to provide the security? Thirty-eight security guards due to work at Heathrow were not vetted through the uh, Department of Transportation, British Department of Transportation Security counterterrorism checks. The company that provides that security, Securicorps, is the parent organization for the largest security provider in the United States, Argenbright, which was just recently, a year ago, fined a million seven hundred thousand dollars, put on 36 months probation, and then found by the Inspector General of the Department of Transportation to be in violation of their uh, uh, consent order. Well, if this private companies have uh, failed under this intense British security oversight system, uh, they failed in the United States, it's time to have clear line of accountability. Mr. Young, yeah. Mr. Young, I have, a, I have another question. Um, I have seen the majority leader, Mr. Army, a member of your party, quoted widely in the press saying the reason that he's against the Senate bill is that these people might belong to unions, might join unions. Do you share Mr. Army's view? Is that why you're opposed to the Senate no, bill? No, and don't try to speak for Mr. Army when I, uh, he's I, not I've here. I've seen him quoted widely right, But I'm not going to speak press. for him. I'm going to tell you where I'm coming from. Most of the companies that could get these contracts are already unionized. Well, then why is They're Mr. Already Army opposed to this? I have no idea. You asked Mr. Army. Basis. This is not about Mr. Army. It's not about me. He's the I'm just saying leader. my he bill, speaks for my your bill, party. my bill, is a better bill for security, and that's what I'm here about. Now, if you can't look at that and look at it objectively, if you disagree with me, fine. But don't bring other people into this. So you're not uh, taking the position that Mr. Army has, has nothing been to do on. with unions. You're not, because you're not already complaining unions. about these people belonging no, to the unions. Never have. Have you, you ever heard me say that? I just wanted to be clear on that well, because Mr. Army say it. Because Mr. Army is the spokesman and the leader of your party. And I am the chairman of the committee, and neither one of these gentlemen ever heard me say that. Yeah, I think that's very helpful to know. Okay. Um, I would, uh, would ask uh, Mr. Oberstar um, one other question. Can you explain how your legislation that you're advocating for provides more flexibility in dealing with the federal screeners to address inadequate job performance? To, to address in inadequate job performance. That's one of the issues that's been raised. Oh, if these people work for the government, then there's no way of addressing inadequate job performance. We can't get rid of them. That's one of the things that, the, that some of the people promoting the Republican legislation say. Well, the, uh, the Senate uh, bill gives the Department of Justice authority for screening uh, of passengers and baggage at the 137 largest airports and to set the terms and conditions for the hiring of this workforce. That will be done by the Attorney General. 
that is uh, identical to the proposal I put in the uh, Democratic alternative in our committee to give the Secretary or Under Secretary of Transportation authority to hire, fire, uh, supervise, train this personnel workforce to the highest possible standards, but to a standard and with uh, a standing separate and distinct from the federal civil service. We intend this to be a, not part of the regular federal civil service, so that the department has, uh, in this case, the attorney general, uh, justice department has full flexibility. Thank you, I have no further questions. Could I, just, uh, could I just add one thing for the record? Uh, we, uh, both Mr. Young and I, have tried to stay out of this uh, public sector uh, union versus private sector, but the American Federation of Government Employees Legislative Director, Beth Moten, M-O-T-E-N, said uh, the union could live with the measure, speaking of the Senate bill, but litigation may be required to ensure most of the civil service obligations remain in place and that would be without, uh, without performance standards. As you may recall, I was chairman of civil service for four years, uh, the subcommittee. I tried for four years to get performance standards and they were beaten every time by the Senate. Incidentally, the uh, federal employers uh, file workplace complaints uh, 10 times more often than their private sector counterparts. And the average time to process a federal employee complaint is 1,186 days some 36, uh, or some, some 38 months. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let, uh, when all else fails, read the language. Is this the same uh, language? Notwithstanding any other provision of law, the Attorney General may employ, appoint, discipline, terminate, and fix the compensation, terms, and conditions of employment of federal service for such a number of individuals as the Attorney General no, determines to be necessary to carry out the passenger screening functions. They're ready to litigate that language. Thank you. Mr. Hall? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, is there anything in the House bill that deals with the issue of luggage that's checked? Yes. What do you, what do you say? We expect that when the manager's bill amendment gets to the floor that all luggage will be x-rayed or examined for explosive devices. All luggage. All luggage. And will it be checked with uh, the people that are coming on the plane like they do? They have to, the person has to be on the airplane with the luggage or the luggage doesn't go. We have that provision. Yeah. The Senate does not. It's, it's in the House bill. Yes. yes. It's not in the Senate bill. Okay. Well, well that, not, not quite, uh, Mr. Hall, if I may. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Senate passed bill directs the FAA to develop a program for 100% screening of checked baggage. And while the program is being developed, because there is none now, and it has to be uh, crafted, uh, the uh, uh, bill requires uh, increased use of positive passenger bag mats for all domestic flights. Uh, just to, for the record, uh, we did a hearing on rulemaking in the Department of Transportation. It takes 3.8 years on average to get a rule in place. The Senate bill does not address uh, rulemaking on an expedited basis in any way. So the baggage will be the same way. The screeners, it's been six years, and today we still don't have in place standards. What, one last question on the same issue. We bought a lot of, we gave the airlines a lot of money or the airports a lot of money for these screeners, didn't we, a few years ago? We bought the screeners, not the screeners, the technician, uh, equipment to de detect Explosives. And right. we found out because we directed them to do so, most of them are in a warehouse because they don't work. And why this is why we need the flexibility to make sure the best technology is used, not this technology is present today. We had a hearing, John had a hearing uh, on this problem. One of the problems we have, and even in screening, there are new explosives being developed every day that may not be picked up with the known technology today. We have to be able to use that technology and improve as we go along, and our bill allows that to happen. I don't think the Senate bill does anything. I will tell you that right up. Mr. Hall, this is, this is equipment that's available that has already been tested and not deployed because we can't get a rule passed, and the Senate bill does not address expedited rule to get this kind of equipment in place. 
These are all plastic uh, weapons, uh, and they can be detected, and explosives can be detected. And we also have the changing phenomena, which was testified, Mr. Lipinski heard it, of the explosives being changed faster than the equipment, the actual explosive matter. So that's why we have to have the ability to change this, not go out and buy $443 million worth of equipment, some that does work, some that doesn't work, and some that isn't deployed, which we did the last time we've been through this exercise. I just want to say in regards to those machines, uh, there's one machine that really works quite well. It's not quite as fast as we were led to believe, but it actually works quite well. Airlines have not been using it because it slows down the process, unfortunately, of getting people on the planes. There is one piece of equipment that doesn't work at all, and they just keep them in warehouses. Unfortunately, that piece of equipment, uh, as far as Congress wanted to have some competition in these machines, I guess to improve technology, so they designated there'd be another machine purchased. Uh, that machine, as I say, just lingers in a warehouse someplace because it doesn't do the job at all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I join you in uh, your words uh, with regard to uh, our dear friend uh, Jerry Solomon. He was a great American and uh, a great legislator as well as a great friend, and, and I will certainly miss him uh, uh, deeply, and look, I will be in that, uh, plan to be on that uh, uh, trip tomorrow to his uh, funeral. Um, I uh, have been listening to trying to understand the differences between the, uh, among the three bills uh, uh, as, as much as uh, possible. And um, I often speak to the people who at uh, the airports where I pass by, especially obviously uh, uh, my hometown, uh, work there, uh, and they're hardworking people. Uh, they uh, uh, they, uh, the screeners are, uh, uh, yes, they're low wage, and I think that, and I've, and I've always supported uh, their uh, the pay being raised, uh, but they work hard. And I think that uh, uh, we should uh, improve their training, uh, obviously supervise them in a standard way uh, throughout the country, and uh, improve uh, safety, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, the federal supervision, um, I do not support firing 30,000 uh, low-wage workers, uh, and um, uh, rather would like to see their pay increased and like to see them trained better and like to see them uh, supervised by federal agents and actually patted on the back for working hard. Uh, am I? Uh, correct, Mr. Young, that uh, my views are more reflected by the House bill than by uh, our friend Mr. Obistar's or the Senate's uh, bills? I believe it does. Now, you have to keep in mind, if we're talking about security or keeping people employed, they're two different things. If they're not qualified, they shouldn't be working. That's for sure. But those that are qualified. They should be working. Those that are qualified Absolutely. and work hard, if they're supervised well and they're standardized and there's federal agents supervising them, they wouldn't necessarily have to be fired. That's what our, work, uh, that's what our bill does. All right. Thank you. I'd like to follow if up I, if on I may uh, respond yes. uh, just a moment, uh, Mr. Uh, Ballard. Yes, Ballard. Uh, they, uh, both approaches re require a transition from the existing system to a, a new system. In that process, we anticipate in, in both approaches that those who are now performing the screening function will continue to do so under some uh, authority and that as a new system is established, those who are performing will apply for those positions. And as, if they qualify by nationality uh, standards and, and by skills requirement and criminal background checks, they're certainly eligible for continued employment. There are roughly 15,000 screeners today. But we've already passed, uh, and I'm glad we have, uh, the criminal background requirement. So that's something that, that was enacted we, last year we've and, taken and, care of. and uh, ordered to be implemented on the 17th of September. Right. Well, thank you all, all uh, gentlemen, for your hard work. And uh, obviously, there's no issue uh, of more interest and importance to the country. It was to be implemented on the 17th, so it never was. It was. It's still not in place. When was that passed? A year ago? I'm a year ago, yes. We did it in 96 also. 
And so there really was no attempt either on the part of the employers. We did that in 1996 and we did it again in 2000 and today we still don't have some of these things in place. Yeah. That's why the Senate bill is a complete farce. If you pass the Senate bill, you miss the whole crux of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's getting some of these things done with someone in authority, someone in responsibility on an immediate basis, period. In reading through the bill, I came across one section where you grandfather uh, some people as screeners. Is that correct? Senate bill does. Ours, so does. I was just, I was Ours does not. We set qualifications and standards. We don't grandfather anybody. You have 90 percent of the screeners at Dulles Airport are not, 90 percent are not American citizens. Yeah. But I'm assuming that people who do work as 90%? 80 to 90. Well, I'm assuming then that uh, that the people who do screen well will be, will be able, as Mr. Ogestar, I think, just explained, that they would also be eligible to apply. May I say again, Mr. Ogestar is my bill when it first started. Mm -hmm. We got within 10%. And now we're talking about the Senate bill, which is a dog meat. That's what bothers me. If we have to discuss this thing, talk about the House bills. Both of them have a great deal of merit in it. I'm going to say that. We got within one word, may and shall. Uh, and they, they insisted they must be all federal employees. Stop and think about this. Go away from this stuff from a couple of years ago. Think, what did we do? We required, we had 28,000 baggage creators become federal employees. And we missed the rest of the picture. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, I flew down today on U.S. Air Shuttle from New York City at high noon. There were 15 people on 747. My colleague Gregory Meeks told me he came in an hour earlier. There were eight people. Uh, obviously, the American people don't feel a bit secure about flying. And to follow a little bit on what Martin said, that you think if there were 28,000 federal employees, they would all belong to a union. But I've even heard it said they would all be Democrats. I would really <laughs> like to understand the rationale behind don't that. Ever Maybe believe we'll that. learn something. <laughs> No, but you keep in mind, the people that are going to be employed have a right to organize unions. Right. I'm not, this is not my argument. I'm talking about the best qualified people. But what about the Democrat piece? What makes them automatically Democrats? I didn't if they're say federal? that. I never said I, that. No, I know they said this in Alaska. You know, remember, and, we and you know, guess, I, who opposed, guess who opposed Alaska to become an estate? The Democrats. I mean, they, uh, the Democrats supported the Republicans rascals. opposed it. Yeah. yeah. Because well, they put three more uh, Democrat representatives. Guess what? We're all Republican now. There I, is there is a light. Believe me, there than is the a governor. light. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I appreciate that's a sore subject. But nonetheless, the reason given most, and the one that people ask about, is why in the world, if we federalize employees, they will suddenly become Democrats. I have no idea. Uh, but it, it's not much comfort you can leave it to private the citizenry at large. You can leave it private and What you they can would still like to think is we don't care if they're Republicans, Democrats, <coughs> whatever they are, we want people who are competent and That's we want right. them to have the opportunity to do does. this job. Senate Bill does but, do it. Ms. Slaughter, if, if, if I might uh, uh, strike a slightly overstated uh, a point a moment ago, we reached uh, an impasse over one word. Uh, yes, but I offered numerous uh, compromises, all of which were rejected not by the chairman, Mr. Young, but by House leadership, party leadership. If Mr. Young had been left to negotiate a bill in the best public interest, we'd have had that bill crafted and ready for the floor. But it's been sidetracked by other forces. I believe not. Thank you. Thank you. That was good enough Thank answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your hard work. And um, I would like to identify with the remarks of my colleague, Mr. diaz Bellart, uh, relative to um, Jerry Solomon and also relative to the uh, workers who are qualified being allowed to compete and keep those jobs if um, that happens. But my main question is on check baggage. And forgive me, I was a little late getting here. If you covered it, I may not have heard it. I understand in the bill on page 27, it says use of screening equipment. And this was the only thing I could find about check baggage. And I, there may be something else. The undersecretary shall ensure that equipment installed at airports to screen check baggage as used to the maxima, at maximum extent possible. That's all it says, but then in the manager's amendment, Mr. Young, you have uh, 
a line that says strengthens existing language in the bill on the screening of checked baggage. Could you just explain to me what that entails? I'm very concerned about the fact we don't do it. Well, it's my intent, as I told the president today, uh, on behalf of um, Mr. Shays and Mr. Inslee, that uh, my intent is to have every baggage that checked in today screened with the best technology we have available. And I, I want to stress that. As far as I'm concerned, I think every bag ought to go through an X-ray, just like you go through an X-ray right. when you when you have your carry-on. Exactly. And that's what I intend to do. And uh, you know, if we can write it differently to make sure it happens, I'd gladly try to do it because I personally think that should be done. Uh, that the baggage should be screened uh, because I'm not as worried about a terrorist quote. I'm worried about the copycats right now. That's who I'm worried about. The best way to try to pick it up. But keep in mind, our testimony was that regardless of what type of technology we have available today, they will be able to outwit us, and we have to have the ability to put in updated right. technology instead of de designating a specific piece of equipment. But make sure every piece of baggage is x-rayed and, and, and detected as possible with, um, uh, for explosives within the bag itself. Well, that's my concern, because I also appreciate the fact that you have put into the bill that, you know, the... The person should be on the plane if their bag is checked. But, you know, we're in a different situation now where somebody can still get on a plane with a bomb in their bag, and they care. I mean, they don't care because we've seen that happen. So it's not the same as it used to be. And I just encourage you that whatever language you can use or however you can do it, that we do screen all baggage at the airport. I, I agree with that. Thanks, and I appreciate your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman Young, when you began a, a portion of your comments, you indicated that if the um, uh, substitute offered uh, were offered by Mr. Overstaff, which some of us believe would get something to the president's desk early on, um, you indicated that that was mischievous, mischievous yes. and, and that 100 United States senators um, who passed uh, the legislation that in many respects is uh, what Mr. Overstar is offering, uh, that they were irresponsible. I, I'm and I will stand by that word because it was 100 to 1 because it was a voice vote. There was about three people on the floor. Mm -hmm. That's easy to do to have a voice vote and say everybody voted for it unanimously. Let's not kid ourselves about that. Secondly, may I suggest again, the Senate bill does not give us the security, the security that's necessary. When I say it's mischievous, the fact that it precludes the chance of a conference, which I think we can work out many, many of our differences. It precludes that. It goes, mm -hmm. to, the, it goes to the president's desk. He has to sign it, and I will admit that with Mr. Lipinski. He will sign it. But it won't give us the security I think is necessary. But it would give us something that would get to the president's desk. It will give you nothing but window desk. dressing. That's all it is, window dressing. I see. Then let's go to some substance with reference to uh, the bill, and I'll follow up uh, with my colleague, Ms. Myrick. Um, what, what, what is wrong with putting the language in your manager's um, uh, measure that will, in fact, say that all baggage has to be screened before it goes on an airplane, either in the underbelly or anywhere? We expect that will be in the manager's measure. I don't understand minutes. expect. I, I respect you, uh, uh, Don, but expect will be there. expecting doesn't give me okay, law. It will be. It will be there when? It will be when we offer the manager's amendment. Yeah, now you're the same guy, along with others, that told us that we would have a displaced workers bill um, at some point in time. A month ago you said that, and now we are here yep. on this matter, and we still don't have a now displaced you're, you're workers mixing, bill. You're mixing, Mr. Judge, apples and oranges. I do support that, as you know that. Mm -hmm. But I don't control everything. What I do control, I do control, but I don't control that part of the game. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that, but I want to go back to this baggage thing, and then I want to ask uh, Mr. Micah if he'd be so good as to give us a better explanation of that thing you're holding up that is uh, technology. I believe in all of the state-of-the-art technology being utilized, and, and what does that thing do when you say there's no rule that covers it at this point? Again, you get back to the, the basic problem between the House bill and the Senate bill, and Mr. Oberstar and Mr. Lipinski helped write this, this language, too, was that we, we gave someone the ability, the, the responsibility and the authority to adopt rules immediately. No ifs, ands, or buts. The only way they can be, uh, that those rules could be taken down is by a panel of law enforcement uh, 
uh, representatives of each of the enforcement agencies, the Secretary of Treasury, the, sec uh, the uh, Attorney General, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the problem we have is we can't get equipment like this because we can't get a rule in place that FAA. says you have to have this kind of equipment in place. All right, now that detects plastic and guns, yeah. et cetera. Actually, Customs has some of this. We bought about 20 or 30 million when I was chairman of criminal uh, justice drug policy. We brought all the staff in. We had a display of this. It can even do it, it can do it so fast. They're using it, uh, we bought enough of it to put on the Mexican border to take trains mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. and it will detect, you can set it for anything, human beings, cash, drugs, uh, plastics, whatever. And there's no reason why we can't have this deployed. But we can't get a rule passed, just like we can't get a rule for standards for uh, screeners passed. Six mm -hmm. years, and we still don't today have the rule. And so the undersecretary in this bill... Is given all the responsibility mm -hmm. and, and clear so uh, we're creating, authority. So we're creating a bureaucracy within an existing but bureaucracy. But you're creating one position with the authority. I defy anyone to get a copy of the organization chart of the Department of Transportation and tell me who's in charge of transportation security. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not very clear. What's worse, the Senate bill, take this chart and take the bill home tonight. I tried to diagram it. Who's in charge of what? This, you talk about bifurcating, this try and quadricates the entire process. God only knows who's in charge under this system. This isn't a political, this isn't a Republican issue, it isn't a Democrat. And these gentlemen all agreed to this, and we came that close to an agreement on the House side for a much better bill than the Senate bill. This does not solve the problem. This creates a, uh, a, a disaster, a potential for disaster. Just look at, and read the bill and who's in charge of what in here. I can't figure it out. We tried to diagram it. it and they threw this Much together quickly and threw it into our let, lab. Miss, let me miss, ask Ms. Hastings. Ought to react to that. May, may I yeah. just respond that the, uh, the Senate passed bill does establish a Deputy Secretary uh, uh, DOT for transportation security to bring but, together all modes of transportation security to coordinate domestic transportation and emergency responses during national emergency. Right. Yes, but he just said during national emergency, read page six, you have to declare a national emergency, and then where's the rulemaking authority to get something in place in a hurry? Mm -hmm. uh, the only right. thing he has is a report that's required of Congress on what to do well, with general let me, aviation. Let me cut to the chase here, because it, 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 it's becoming increasingly disturbing to me that we are mincing words with something that needs to be dealt with with reference to security. Not you, John, I'm talking all of us. What I wanna see as a person getting on an airplane is that baggage is checked for every potential harm that may occur. And if this bill or the Senate bill or none of them get there, am I to be heard that we don't have the understanding in this house that we can write a measure that will accomplish that end? Our bill does it. You say expect, Don. No, you said I, you I expect said, it yes. to happen. Did what I just tell you a while ago? What did I say? It will be in there. Did I say that? Yeah, I if, said that. If, if I thought you ran the world, then I'd believe that. If I ran the world, but I don't think you run. I don't think you. Yeah, world. I think you think you do sometimes. Oh, yeah, and yeah, therein, yeah, I'm, I'm therein guilty. lies I'm the guilty. problem. I'm what guilty. I'm trying to get here is some substantive language <laughs> that every member of this House of Representatives will go away knowing that there is going to be a check for every potential harm, not just explosives, not just knives and guns, but now the new kinds of things that can be offered, that is the equipment that John is talking about that may be helpful. I mean, come on, people. Well, well, we, the can well, the we can do yes, that with I'll the yield. bill. I yield to the gentleman yeah. uh, from I, have, I know this is a moving target. Mr. Young, I have uh, something that says revised this is a manager's amendment, uh, and it says revised, and it has a 20 up here. I don't know if that's the 20th version or what that means. <laughs> We've got I, five I, more to go. I'm, I'm told this is the most recent version. Five on, more to go. on page 11 of this revised manager's amendment, there is a provision that says screening. It is the sense of Congress <coughs> that the Undersecretary of Transportation for Security should require, as soon as practical, 
that all property carried in a passenger aircraft in air transportation or interstate air transportation, including check baggage, be screened by any currently available uh, means, including x-ray machines, handheld metal detectors, explosive detection system equipment, or manual search. Now, that's the sense of Congress. That doesn't require anything. That doesn't say you have to do it. That just says it's the sense of Congress that the uh, Undersecretary of, uh, for Security should require as soon as practicable. Is that the language that no, you're talking about? Would you about? check page 6? Page 6, line 2? This is on page 11. Well, this is, is on page 6. This is revised on here. Well, this is page 6. Installation of additional explosive detection equipment. The Undersecretary shall install additional explosive detection equipment at airports as soon as possible because we have to get the right equipment to ensure that all check baggage is screened before being placed on the aircraft. That's so, on page 6. But so again, the, uh, so you got, got my time, got, Reclaiming my time. Again, we're talking about explosive detection in your language here. There are more things that can be harmful than explosive detection. And therefore, the screening needs to be a great deal more meticulous. Am I not making sense yes, here? Yes, you are. But what happens? Do we have the equipment to do that right now? You see the anthrax problem we're having right now. Well, can I'm not. We, can we? Can we? Do we have the equipment available? Why do put that equipment in there? Don, if you the Defense Department has tested many of the components that can, in fact, detect many of the things that bioterrorists use. When we get around to deciding that that's going to be useful for the civilian population, then it will be easy for, easier for us to write a bill. Okay. Martin, were you through? May I ask you a question, Judge? Yes, I'll ask you a question. If you read the Senate bill, it has nothing in here about this. I agree with you. Okay. Well, not, yeah, not quite. And, not, and, not, and, not, and the real not, truth not of the matter is, neither one of your bills uh, uh, should be what we are dealing with. We ought to do, do like we do in the day or night around here a lot, and that's write a new one. But I'm not above that, but I've been rewriting this thing every hour on the day for the last three and a half weeks. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Hastings, may, may I just respond to, to that? Uh, let, let, let's be accurate. The uh, Senate language requires a specific, a specific percentage of checked baggage to be scanned by bulk explosive detection machines within six months and annual goals thereafter toward a goal of scanning 100% of checked baggage. But it's in six months. Mine do it right away. Thank you very much. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, too, would like to join my colleagues who... Uh, uh, honor and give respect to Jerry Solomon, who led this committee for uh, many years in service to the nation as a member of Congress and will plan on being at his funeral tomorrow also. Uh, Chairman Young, uh, Chairman Micah uh, began a discussion that talked about uh, performance measurement plans uh, that w might be discussed perhaps in a manager's amendment which would uh, ensure a new standard or a different standard, a higher standard, a standard that could be developed uh, to meet specific requirements of this job. Uh, I have not read revised number 20 in its entirety. Can you discuss with me whether you would or are considering or are working on something related to a performance based measurement plan as it relates to this, or if you're open to that, Chairman Young. I'm going to let Mr. Mike address Oh, that's it. fine. Well, uh, I will say that the Senate bill, and I just read this this morning, does have a provision for performance uh, uh, management, uh, and uh, it's under the Department of Transportation, but it's not clear if it extends to the uh, baggage screeners. We do allow the uh, discretion for all the standards, et cetera, to be put in place by rule on an immediate basis. So if there's a private contractor, they must go under those standards if there, is a, if there are public employees. And remember, our bill allows the president, he could, in fact, have all public employees to do the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. But uh, the standards would also be set, and uh, they'd be able to adopt them as soon as uh, we have that person in position. Good. So you believe that the words are already there, yes, which would allow the authority them. is there and responsibility. Good, Chairman Overstar. I have a question uh, that would be related to some of the debate that has in, in, ensued today. Some of the references related to 
law enforcement, do you anticipate that these baggage screeners are part of uh, a law enforcement, that they would carry guns, that they would be doing those things at a major or airport? I know that we've heard the discussion about at airports with 300,000 landings or less, where local law enforcement may be there, but do you anticipate at the larger air, the largest airports in this country where the baggage screeners would be carrying guns? That would be uh, something the uh, uh, Attorney General would uh, prescribe in his uh, standards to be set for those who would perform the screening. I don't anticipate, we don't now have screeners uh, carrying weapons. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know that, I don't know any argument for doing so, we now have on an interim basis National Guard uh, personnel uh, at the uh, screening checkpoints. They carry serious weapons. And the provision that uh, allows hiring of local law enforcement authorities at, uh, or personnel rather, at uh, those below the 137 largest airports, again, would be a matter of uh, rulemaking by the uh, Attorney General to determine whether they should carry weapons or not. I, I don't see it You don't, a, a you don't see it as a circumstance, but no. you're willing to live by what the Attorney General prescribes. That would be his rulemaking, that's right. As a further follow-up, and it goes back to the question that we all dealt with earlier before Mr. Hastings and some others raised some very potent questions about the, the, the safety Related to the employees, if the Attorney General decided if he were given the option, uh, is it in your thought process that these employees, if they were federal employees, uh, and I know that the Attorney General can set the GS level and whatever they want, that that would be open for what I would say bid by any federal employee to where they would have a chance to come and bid for those jobs? I most certainly would anticipate so. So in other words, we could end up, and <coughs> I have great respect for federal employees, but if we went and had this job, and I'll just use an example with a, uh, uh, and I don't know what you're thinking a GS rate would be. I won't try and challenge you on that point. But, but the difference between a starting salary and a 10-year salary in many instances is $10,000 per person. Do you believe that that would escalate the cost of what this started out to be a program at one point and all of a sudden ended up at a different point? Do you believe that that's a flexibility difference that the government would have or the Attorney General would have but when looking at how to hire? But the, the language is, is written so that the uh, Attorney General has the flexibility to establish the training, the background checks, which of course is already uh, federal law and uh, was published as a rulemaking to implement that law in the Federal Register, has uh, authority to uh, uh, fire unsatisfactory workers or screeners, uh, and to set their level of compensation. And we had anticipate that that level of compensation is going to be substantially higher than the current just above minimum wage. Sure. And in crafting the, the bill that uh, Mr. Young, Mr. Mike, and I were, were working on, and so we came to a, a, a loggerhead, uh, we were thinking in, in the range that uh, you, you have to pay these people in the range of thirty thirty five thousand dollars $35,000 a year, and that uh, would... Uh, is that, that was, a starting salary? That was a number, uh, that would be an average number, and, and uh, that would be something the, the so secretary the would have to establish. Yeah. But that would be compensated by the $2.50 surcharge. Sure. One way so surcharge. So in other words, Chairman, I hear you saying around a GS-10 level that would... I was thinking GS-9, GS you know, mid-step. Mid, mid that level today goes from 32,000 the first year to 42,000 at the end of 10 years. Well, again, that's a matter that the, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Justice will have to establish. And 
look at the dollar revenue generated by the by the surcharge and make sure they live within it. So my question is, do you believe or see, you do not have to agree with it, that this is a lack of flexibility that would be given the Attorney General? Oh no, the, 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 it's up to, we, we do not in this legislation prescribe the dollar amounts. That's that's to be set by the Attorney General. The same in, in uh, I, I don't think there is any compensation level in the uh, committee. So bill. in other words, the Attorney General could say this is a $35,000 a year job and we will not increase that a year job. except as prescribed by law. Yeah. So we would get away from, you're envisioning, get away from a GS schedule. And if they yeah. want to decide they're just $36,000 a year jobs with a bonus based upon a performance schedule, you're happy with that. That's exactly, we want this to be established outside the established civil service. So it is uh, a unique federal screener program, but not encumbered with the rest of the civil service. Not, not encumbered right. with any of the civil service things, but rather specifically what the attorney That's general That's why there's said. broad flexibility to write the program as the attorney general sees necessary to, to, to do the best possible job. Sure. You've been fair and open with me, and I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Young, I, uh, looking at uh, your revised, uh, what I assume is the manager's amendment, um, and on page 11, Title II on victims' compensation, um, I think that uh, we looked at, at the fact, certainly, uh, of setting up limited liability for the four planes involved in, in the uh, crashes. Uh, in the airline assistance legislation, as I understand it. Um, this appears to be amending that language on liability. So the first question is if you could outline what those changes are. The second is I think a major part of, of any of us uh, looking at moving America ahead is to uh, set up making sure that victims and their families are compensated and taken care of, but without uh, subjecting property owners and the airlines, the airline manufacturers and others to years of litigation. Uh, the World Trade Center ownership of a leaseholder uh, has, has come as well as the Port Authority and their concern of how they may look to mirror the limited liability language that we provide in the airline assistance and whatever may be in this manager's amendment. And so my question to you is at what point do we also look at the potential of Boeing, the World Trade Center, the New York Port Authority, Massport, and uh, the City of New York and New York State, who are all liability exposures that actually increase with the limited liability that we have put in language relative to the airlines uh, of the four affected planes uh, in, in the crash? Mr. Reynolds, one of the things on that page 11 you were talking about I'll fess up, uh, that was given to us by the Judiciary Committee and suggested to be put in the bill by the leadership. And I'm not an expert, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, secondly, uh, I happen to agree with you that we have to address this issue, but this bill can't solve all our problems. This is supposed to be a security bill. And, and I, I want to stress that, a security bill. And I happen to agree we have to address the issues of World Trade Centers, the airlines themselves, and, and where are we going to go in this whole in, insurance uh, equation. As you know, uh, the airlines industry's uh, insurance rates, I believe, have gone up 2,000% since uh, September the 11th. Uh, we have the insurance company come into us, into the Congress, and asking us to back them up under a wartime provision. I think the Judiciary Committee has jurisdiction and the Commerce Committee over this, and they'll have to address this issue in a separate bill. Because um, I'm not an expert in this field. We tried to set forth a bill, Mr. Mike has helped, uh, and even the minority, uh, that would try to bring the best security to the nation excluding some of those subjects which you just spoke of. Uh, Judge Hastings talked about the, the compensation pact, which I still support. Um, but you can't go on with this bill. Uh, if we put everything on this bill, you know, have at it. Uh, it's going to be fun to try to debate what we've got. And so I, I can't give you all the full answers on Mr. Chairman, your sense as judiciary asked that this uh, uh, be considered in, in your legislation, that the Judiciary Committee is uh, open-minded to looking at what we address in the limited liability, as you and I concur, may be needed to be done in separate legislation? 
I can't speak for Mr. Sensenbrenner, uh, but I suggest that uh, this is one of the issues that all of us have to be talking about to try to get it done, because it has to be done. I thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Oberstar, you wanted to make a comment? I just wanted to uh, uh, comment on, on the uh, gentleman's uh, concern, and it is rightfully placed. The uh, lease holder for the land that was uh, Twin Towers wants to rebuild, but there are still uh, a thousand lawsuits outstanding against the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey from the 1993 bombing that have not been resolved, and there will be multiples of that number if there isn't some uh, limit on liability comparable to that which was included for American and United Airlines in the compensation package. But as the chairman, uh, Chairman Young, has said, we can't solve all those problems in this uh, legislation, and uh, it's not only uh, the limitation uh, on liability for uh, the Port Authority, there could be several others who have a similar interest. But if the uh, Trade Towers are ever to be rebuilt along the lines that uh, the uh, developer proposes with a memorial and a, and a performing arts center, it, th this matter does have to be resolved. The gentleman's raised a very important issue. Let me just say that uh, I know Mr. Frost and I were just uh, discussing earlier a question that uh, I think we, we didn't actually get an answer to, and it has to do with this issue of the citizenship of screeners. I know there was talk of this 80% plus uh, figure of people at uh, Dulles International Airport who are not American citizens, and Mr. Frost was just asking me if we um, if we know whether there's language in, in this our, bill that does provide a requirement. Well, not 99% American citizen, 100% American citizen. Mr. Chairman, if I may pursue Mr. this. Mr. Frost. Um, do you have any idea, Mr. Young, about what percentage of the current screeners throughout the system are American citizens and what percentage are not I American heard citizens? it was 80 to 90 percent that were not American citizens at Dulles. That's uh -huh. where one of the infractions took place. This is the one thing we hear from the general public in total. Dulles is the one area we continue to hear about. That's right. Example and and I, you know, in really other areas, it's just as bad. I go a little bit further in my bill. I think I do. Uh, maybe I don't. I know I have some, I want them all to speak English. Mm -hmm. And uh, that causes a lot of hair rising. But I tell you this, if this is a, this is not about just certainly jobs. It's about security. And you have to have the best people there in security, understanding people, and be able to read yeah. the uh, programs and, and, in fact, do the job. Yeah, Mr. Young, I don't think there's any disagreement about that. Uh, I was just trying to make sure, and I see the provision in your bill that requires the baggage screeners uh, to be citizens of the United States. It sounds like under your bill that you'd have to fire uh, a great number of the people who are currently in those positions because they're not they get their citizenship papers in. What we are they doing? Are they, by the way, a large percentage were illegally here. No, no, Mr. Young, I'm just asking. It, it appears to me that we'd have to get rid of a whole bunch of these people right away because they're not citizens. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally agree with that. I think we okay. they should be citizens. My, my question, though, is this does not, it, it appears that under either system, whether you go to a uh, a system that they're federal employees or they're private contractors, you're going to have a whole bunch of new people in these jobs, and that going to federal employees is no more disruptive than uh, getting rid of all the private screeners who are not citizens right I'm now. I'm not arguing about federalization, and that's not my bag, as I told you before. I'm arguing about the best qualified people doing uh, We, I, I could not agree with you more, Mr. Young, and I can tell you from the people Good. that I represent uh, who go through Dallas-Fort Worth Airport and go through the other major airports in this country, there is great concern about the quality of the people who are currently in those jobs who are private contractors. And I think the, they ought to be citizens. They ought to clearly be qualified. My only point was that uh, we're going to have a whole new system, whichever approach we go to. Whether your bill passes or whether Mr. Oberstar's bill passes, this is going to be a brand new system. Uh, and, and, um, and respect to my good friend, it's not Mr. Oberstar's bill. I, I, I understand. We're going to have a He had a good bill. Unfortunately, we couldn't come to the We're going to we're we're have a, a terrible bill right now. We're going to have a brand new system with uh, with a lot of new people hired. That's right. Uh, that I think we I think we've uh, pretty well come and, to and, that, and, that and, conclusion. And and and, and we should, Mr. Young. Just yeah. the, what the way that the area that you and I disagree, and that Mr. Oberstar uh, disagrees with you, is that these should be federal employees, not private contractors, because of the past record. We've spent an hour and a half on this panel. It's been fascinating, and. Uh, we're going to have the closing statement from Mr. Lipinski, I guess, since he's waving his hand at Thank me. you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, it's just I want to make sure the record is straight here. The vote on the Senate bill in the Senate 
final passage was a recorded vote. 100 senators voted for Here this bill. Question. The voice vote occurred on taking the function of governing the screeners into the Justice Department. That was a voice vote. But this bill passed the Senate federalizing the screeners 100 recorded votes to nothing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I may respond. I guess Mr. Young is going to have the last word. I may word respond. As, you know the crucial vote was the voice vote. That was what was taken, not the other vote, and you know that. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your hard work on this issue, and that uh, concludes this panel. I'm happy to see that we have, uh, we have two other members of the uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee who are with us, Mr. La Tourette and Ms. Melinda McDonald. If you two would come forward, we're... We've been awaiting your testimony all afternoon, and we're happy to have you. And please feel free to uh, enter any prepared remarks that you have into the record, and we'll welcome a summary. Mr. La Tourette. If it's all right with you, I'll yield to Ms. Melinda McDonald to go first. My dear friend and neighbor and fellow Californian, Ms. Melinda McDonald, we're happy to have you. You might want to turn the microphone on there, just push that little button there. I thought I was already being heard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member. And all of the members here today, I am here because of the myriad of persons that I have heard around this country asking and pleading for an aviation security bill. We know that September 11th has changed our lives completely. It will never be the same. And I am uh, adamant about the whole notion that we're still grappling with a notion of trying to get a bill through. This bill should simply, Mr. Chairman, speak to a fortified cockpit, it should speak to federalizing uh, your, your screeners, it should speak to the flight attendants having anti-hijacking um, training, improved training for them, and really the argument here, it's my amendment that I have that I've, I'm bringing before you, because we really do need an anti-terrorist threat assessment so that we will know what we're talking about in terms of going after these rogues and these thugs who did this upon us on September the 11th. So is the amendment that I'm bringing forth today. But I am in agreement with our getting an aviation security bill out of this house so that we can return people to the airplanes, we can increase our tourism, we are falling behind on those two elements, and more importantly, the American people are asking for some type of security in aviation. Mr. Chairman and the members, I'm simply asking you to, in agreement uh, in supporting an aviation transportation bill, to also to uh, bring in to uh, make an order in my amendment that speaks to an anti-terrorist threat assessment. Mm -hmm. That is solely needed. We've heard from the state of California, from the governor all the way down to the mayors mm -hmm. of the city of Los Angeles and all of the cities asking for this assessment. Thus is my reason for being here, also in support of an aviation security uh, Thank you very bill. much, Ms. Melinda McDonald. We appreciate your thoughtful testimony. Mr. La Tourette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, congratulations to Mr. Randezzo on his new employment opportunity. I think that's a wonderful thing to him, for him, and a sad thing for the committee. I know about that. My... <laughs> <laughs> My, my amendment, Mr. Chairman and members, is so easy, and it's so easy because when I came before you the last time when we were doing the airline assistance bill, at that time we delivered $5 billion to airlines, also $10 billion in loan guarantees. All I said to you at that time is that we should have a system in place that if somebody buys a ticket on a route that's discontinued, they should uh, be able to go on another airline. It was, it was pretty simple. Most of you agreed. Mrs. Price has been working very hard uh, uh, with us and others to get that done. And so on the bill before you today, you have sense of Congress language. It says that it's the sense of Congress that if you have a ticket and the route's discontinued, that you should get a, a, a ticket on another carrier. Well, when the chairman was here and Mrs. Price, was, Judge Price was talking to him, he said he would have liked to have gone further, but there was jurisdictional problems. Well, you don't have a jurisdictional problem with, a, with an amendment. Uh, I don't care if it's banking or financial services or judiciary. Mm -hmm. If you make this amendment in order, you can make sure that the people that we're now asking to shell out $5 billion plus $10 billion in loan guarantees plus pay $2.50 surcharge to secure themselves in airports, can get a ticket on an airplane refunded if they bought one. Please make my amendment in order. Thank you very much. Mr. Blender, no? Thank you. What about Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lautrep, for the work you've done on this. I, I certainly hope we can include it, too. Uh, I, I appreciate the committee's going as far as they have, but as I indicated to the chairman, 
Uh, I don't think it's quite far enough. We need to assure these folks that once they buy a ticket, they're not going to get stranded at the airport forever, and uh, I'll continue to uh, keep the heat on if I can. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I um, uh, support uh, both the measures, and I'd say to Ms. Uh, Melinda McDonald that uh, on yesterday in New York, the Homeland Security Subcommittee of the Intelligence Committee had a public hearing, and your sheriff, Mr. Baca, mm -hmm. uh, from your county, gave um, a very detailed um, analysis of the threat assessment that was done for the transportation system in Los Angeles. So if it's any comfort to you, it may not be nationwide that it's satisfactory, but at least in Los Angeles, he was extremely impressive and uh, had along with him uh, uh, other personnel that came uh, uh, before. Him. Thank you, Mr. Hastings. He serves on the government, uh, on our governor's rather, uh, Homeland Security Task Force in California. So thank you for that, that comment. Mr. Chairman, I might add that there, there's language in the bill that speaks a little bit to the threat assessment, but it doesn't go far enough because what we're suggesting, not only should we have this very critical artery that runs through the body of this country, which is transportation infrastructure, but we're talking about also public places where folks have congregated as a result of transportation, talking about where the president's going to be tonight uh, with the baseball, uh, at the baseball um, uh, event. So, so um, we're saying that is this bill, this amendment is a stronger uh, version of that. Plus, it asks that we re get a report back within a certain length of time. The other language does not suggest that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next, uh, Chairman, let me uh, join in offering condolences and respect for the late former chairman, Mr. Solomon. I think that the debate today captures the spirit of Jerry Solomon, fair, vigorous, and uh, in the spirit of public service. I would simply ask that we uh, make an order as a substitute the amendment that Mr. Gansky and I have put forward following the leadership of Mr. Overstar, that is the Senate bill that passed the Senate by 100 to nothing. Uh, I think that the wide range of debate that we've heard, spirited questions that we've heard, make the case for why this should be made in order. There are strongly divergent opinions. The House should work its will on those strongly divergent opinions. And I think that it would honor the uh, public commitment the Republican leadership has made to give us a clean vote on an alternative. The best alternative, in my view, is the one that passed the Senate 100 to nothing, and that is literally the substance word for word, uh, comma for comma, of the amendment Mr. Gansky and I are offering. Mr. Gansky. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I, too, uh, uh, express condolences for Mr. Solomon's uh, family. You know, Mr. Solomon was a man that was not very big in physical size, but he sure had a big heart. And uh, there was never a dull moment when he was on the floor. And uh, I think we all miss him uh, a great deal. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's not very often that I get to correct uh, the chairman of the Transportation Committee, Don Young, who is a friend. But the chairman was wrong, because there was a recorded vote in the Senate on final passage. 100 United States senators voted for that bill, including Senators Murkowski and Ted Stevens. In fact, both Republicans, Mr. Stevens uh, was an original co-sponsor of that bill. 
And I guess I'd have to say it's an unusual situation when you have uh, senators like uh, Kay Bailey Hutchinson and Phil Graham uh, voting with Paul Wellstone. Or when you have uh, Jesse Helms voting with Barbara Boxer. And the key to the uh, 100 to 0 vote was an amendment crafted by Mike DeWine, a senator, a Republican senator from Ohio, which basically moved the jurisdiction into that of the D Justice Department for those screeners. Every single Republican senator voted by recorded vote for that bill. And that's what we'd like to see you make in order. Uh, Mr. Andrews and I uh, submitted our amendment in the form of a, a substitute, uh, not knowing for sure what the uh, Democratic substitute would be. They're identical. Uh, I am on board with that, our, as are many of my, our fellow uh, Republicans. You know, there are those who rail against putting airport safety in the hands of government employees, as if that were something evil. Well, here's the real story, Mr. Chairman. All those brave firefighters and police officers in New York City who lost their lives were government employees. All those courageous Capitol Hill policemen who a few years ago saved lives here in the Capitol, and in the process lost their lives, they were government employees. The men and women in our armed, so armed forces who are currently fighting in Afghanistan are government employees. The FBI agents who put their lives on the line are government employees. Those postal workers, Mr. Chairman, who have lost their lives are government employees. Look, the Senate bill strikes the right bipartisan compromise because it puts safety ahead of big special interests. The companies who are bankrolling the effort to kill those vital protections for American citizens are foreign-owned companies. So that's the question, Mr. Chairman. Are we going to take commonsensical, practical steps to improve our safety, or will we entrust our lives to foreign corporations who pay the minimum wage and are already threatening to sue the U.S. government? The bipartisan Senate bill empowers Attorney General John Ashcroft. Let me repeat that. The Senate bill empowers Attorney General John Ashcroft to set the terms and conditions of employment for those screeners, including dismissal, and they cannot strike. Mr. Young didn't quite say it, but he alluded to it. We have the b bizarre situation where he has crafted a bill that the Service Employees International Union is in favor of, because as Mr. Young announced, the SEIU has unionized those private foreign corporations, and they intend to do more so. So to my Republican colleagues who have been somewhat concerned about the unionization issue, which I don't think should be pertinent anyway, look at that issue a little bit. I'll tell you what bothers me the most, Mr. Chairman, is that if the House passes the young bill, we're going to end up in gridlock in a conference. The voters elected us to solve problems, not just talk about them. Let us put this airport security bill where it belongs, on the president's desk, and he'll sign it, and we'll get this thing moving. Thank you very much, Mr. Stansky. Let's go under Ms. Paul, Ms. Price, Ms. Slaughter, Mr. diaz Blard, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Hastings, Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Reynolds. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We thank appreciate you, Mr. your Chairman. thoughtful testimony and uh, your compelling arguments. Uh, I've already called on Mr. Smith, but I'm happy to uh, go back to uh, Mr. Smith, who is our next witness. Please uh, offer a summary, and we're going to try and move through this uh, hearing as quickly as possible. The microphone. This is an amendment uh, that a airline retrofitting company said might be a shortcoming in the bill. The legislation only calls for uh, the reinforcement of the cockpit door. They suggest that it's only cardboard and cloth uh, on the bulkhead on each side of the cockpit except where there's a galley uh, on the right side. So my amendment simply adds the, to the cockpit door, it adds uh, and the uh, cockpit bulkhead in terms of uh, the forfeiting of that area. Uh, if, the, if the bathroom is up there, all there is is a piece of cardboard and cloth that could be gone through next to the door. So I'm suggesting, and I hope that it might be a part of the manager's amendment. 
And Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Well, let me let me just, uh, if I can briefly suggest uh, the uh, <laughs> the second amendment says let's have a study of a separate entrance for the pilots with a bulkhead that's totally solid that can't be penetrated. If you do that, you reduce the need for uh, security personnel on the airplane. You reduce the need for uh, maybe uh, uh, a terrorist. Uh, deciding if the pilot's serious and shooting the hostesses and the members one by one to get up front. Uh, putting a separate uh, entranceway and then a bulkhead that separates the crew from the, the, the pilots from the rest of the plane uh, has merit in terms of uh, eliminating a lot of the security problems. And I suggest it be explored. This amendment simply calls for a study to uh, explore that possibility. My great pleasure. Mr. Chairman, I have a number of amendments that I'm offering to H.R. 3150, uh, and I will give you a summary of them just very quickly. Uh, the gentlelady, Mrs. Myrick, and uh, Mr. Hastings touched upon a, a very profound point uh, that is absent from H.R. 3150, and I know Mr. Inslee is planning on offering uh, a similar amendment, and I want to congratulate the gentleman from Washington for uh, essentially insisting that the House of Representatives take a vote on the idea of 100% inspection of baggage underneath uh, the aircraft. We heard the chairman of the committee, Mr. Young, essentially offer a sense of Congress amendment to the idea that there should be 100% inspection of baggage uh, underneath uh, the aircraft. Uh, but I would implore you that uh, the people uh, for whom each of us represents have been operating under the assumption that there is 100% security under the aircraft since uh, the crash that took place, uh, the Pan Am 103. Uh, under the present logic of H.R. 3150, if in fact a foreign device uh, gets on one of our commercial aircraft, we will have a strong door that will be left because Congress will have insisted upon a strong door, and we will have a black box. So we will have NTSB telling us that we have remnants of a plane that exploded at 30,000 feet with a strong door and a black box, simply because this Congress did not insist in a reasonable time uh, that 100 percent inspection of all baggage. I know that Mr. Inslee is offering a similar amendment. I am offering uh, this amendment uh, as, as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in the uh, final analysis, uh, the American people deserve the same kind of inspection on these aircraft that you and I experience when we travel on CODELs across the country, uh, 100 percent security and inspection on, on uh, aircraft uh, held and controlled by the Air Force. Uh, the President of the United States has 100 percent inspection of bags on, on his aircraft, and therefore we've never lost uh, a president uh, by virtue of any foreign devices getting on uh, his or her plane. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the American people deserve no less, and this should come to a vote on the floor of the Congress with a reasonable time frame associated uh, with it. Uh, this is my first amendment, Mr. Chairman. You done? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I, have a, I have another amendment, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Uh, that will add to the number of requests made by flight attendants or instructions made by flight attendants prior to boarding an aircraft uh, that the uh, ticket agents and flight attendants will inform the passengers who are about to get on these planes as to whether or not baggage on that aircraft has been uh, inspected and give the passenger who is traveling on that aircraft an opportunity uh, to determine whether or not they want to fly on an aircraft that has baggage that has not been inspected. Uh, I have been uh, driving uh, back and forth to and from Chicago, Mr. Chairman, since the events uh, of September uh, the 11th, because at least from my perspective, uh, this Congress's failure to act to ensure uh, that there is 100 percent inspection of baggage underneath the aircraft. Uh, to provide me with the kind of security that I would desire as I prepare to uh, uh, re-embark upon commercial aircraft, and I know my constituents are concerned about it as well, uh, Chicago, uh, Illinois contains uh, O'Hare Airport, one of the busiest airports uh, in the nation, I'm sure that the traveling public would not, uh, would not be opposed to an announcement by the flight attendant, just as they're beginning to board frequent flyer passengers or boarding first class passengers and inspecting the two bags that we're allowed to carry on board, just a brief announcement by flight attendants uh, as to the status of whether or not all bags on the vehicle that they are presently preparing to board 
uh, have been uh, inspected and give those of us who have small children an opportunity to determine whether or not we want to get on a plane uh, that has not had its uh, bags inspected. Uh, this is my uh, second amendment, and I would consider and hope uh, that this committee would uh, think this amendment uh, a thoughtful one. A number of flight attendants that I have talked to have expressed great interest uh, in this uh, as well. Uh, secondly, Mr. Chairman, uh, thirdly, Mr. Chairman, I offer uh, an amendment that would conduct essentially a feasibility study to develop a new and more secure way to handle and transport airline baggage. Uh, specifically, I'm requesting funds to study the feasibility of establishing a pilot program whereby airline luggage would be handled and transported in a way similar uh, to overnight package delivery. Under this system, your luggage would be picked up from the point of origin, let's say your home or your office, at least 24 hours in advance of your flight. All luggage would be transported by truck to a regional warehouse and distribution center where each bag or suitcase would be inspected and screened. The luggage would then be transported to the local airport and loaded onto the next available appropriate passenger or cargo flight. After landing at the airport, your luggage would be transported by delivery truck or to your final destination, say a hotel room or convention center, where it would be waiting upon your arrival. Such a system would increase security by guaranteeing that every bag and suitcase is properly inspected and screened. It would eliminate the delays, the inconveniences of baggage check at airport terminals, and it would provide the added convenience of door-to-door -door delivery for all luggage for all airline passengers. Obviously, there are many questions about the viability, the reliability, the timeliness, and the convenience and cost of this proposal, and that's why I'm asking that this committee consider ruling in order a feasibility study to determine whether or not it should be a public program or a private sector program uh, whereby such luggage uh, transportation uh, can take uh, can uh, take place. Uh, I might add, uh, Mr. Chairman, that some people have argued that the idea of inspecting every bag on a plane could be very costly and could bring our aviation industry to an immediate halt. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I reject uh, wholeheartedly uh, this logic, uh, in part because if, in fact, a foreign device gets on one of these planes uh, because of Congress's failure to act, to act and ensure that every single bag is inspected, I assure you that the aviation industry will come to a complete halt. And not only will it come to a complete halt, the blame for failure to inspect every bag on these aircrafts will rest firmly at the feet of this Congress for not acting immediately in the context of the, of the current crisis. So the idea that Congress might consider something preventative or proactive in terms of inspecting uh, baggage, I find, um, well, I find it unconscionable if, in fact, an amendment is not allowed in this particular bill that at least ensures that this Congress and this country is en route to 100% inspection. And Mr. Chairman, my final amendment is actually a request of this committee to waive any points of order against this, uh, this final amendment. Since the events of September 11th, the idea that the U.S. military is patrolling the skies of the United States and that the idea that a domestic aircraft carrier could indeed be shot down no longer by executive decision or executive order of the president, uh, but by a, a general, if in fact uh, it is determined that that aircraft is a threat, uh, my amendment uh, essentially offers a, a compensation package uh, for those Americans who lose their lives uh, by virtue of uh, an aircraft that was determined uh, pursuant to executive order uh, to have been a threat to the vital security of, of the United States. The airline bailout bill that we passed has some liability issues associated with it, associated with terrorist acts. But I would hasten to say, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of this committee, that this Congress has yet to deal with the liability associated with our own aircraft shooting down commercial uh, aviation um, uh, vehicles that many Americans assume uh, are are safe as a result of the extraordinary measures that this Congress is taking. I thank the Chairman. Thank, I thank you very much. Thank preparing. you very much, Mr. Jackson. It's very thoughtful testimony. You have some interesting proposals, some of which I think are already addressed in the bill as far as the issue of, uh, of inspecting all the language. We had, uh, I don't know if you were here during the exchange that we had with the, the Chairman of the Committee and Mr. Oberstar on that, but I think that it is addressed in the, in the package that they Mr. have. Mr. Chairman, it's addressed in the uh, in Mr. Oberstar's package, right. but the language in 3150, the Republican package offered right. by Mr. Young, it is a sense of the Congress, and I am asking, Mr. Chairman... Well, I see, I think he went back to page 6 in that bill and found that it actually is uh, included in the bill itself. As 100% inspection. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Linder? Uh, Mr. Hastings? Mrs. Myrick? Thank you very much for being Thank here. You, we Chairman. appreciate it, uh, Mr. Jackson. I don't know how much time we have left on this vote downstairs. I know we have a series of votes.
We've got about a minute left. Um, we we have, I see uh, Mr. Castle is here and would like to testify, and uh, <laughs> Mr. Inslee is here, along with Mr. Strickland, I think, uh, who also would like to testify. And I was just told that Mr. Bonnier would like to come back, and that would mean that everyone would have testified. But since we only have a minute left on the clock, and I, I don't have a 100% voting record downstairs, but I try to keep it as strong as I can, so I'm going to exercise my prerogative and recess the committee until the uh, last vote. And uh, we will reconvene. For those of you, we'd love to hear from you. We'll be here for the evening to uh, listen to your testimony. And uh, so uh, feel free to return after we uh, complete votes and share your thoughts with us. So with that, the committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair.